Good morning, everybody. We are still just doing the last couple moments of setup while we get this uh, live stream all set to go. Want to welcome everybody. If you're here, give a shout out in the uh, comments section in the live chat. If you do not see live chat, refresh your window. We had that disabled just prior to the stream just so that there wouldn't be a lot of, um, honestly, there was just a lot of crude stuff getting posted on the run up to this. You know, you leave a chat box open on YouTube, stuff's gonna get posted in it. So we just enabled that. If you don't see it, hit a refresh on your browser and you should see it. And then give me a shout out, where are you coming from? We are almost ready to go. Hey, we have, it's at 10 o'clock. I think maybe we should get this going. I just wanna verify first that we actually have, let me go to our channel here and make sure that the live stream is going good and we have chat, oh, that's interesting. That's funny, my back end's not showing me all the chat comments, yet the public side is. Oh, there we go. There's a delay in the back end. That's annoying. Okay, let's go ahead and get this started. There's gonna be cars going by. So you just heard that. And three, two, one. And we're live. Hey everybody, welcome to the basement of the Driving Sports TV offices. Uh, we don't have a proper studio per se, but we do have this massive garage to do with what we want. And it is supposed to rain today. First off, I wanna give a couple disclaimers while we're kicking this off. Uh, it is spring and I do have some allergies. So if you hear me sniffling, it's not the C word, which I can't say on YouTube or for fear that they will demonize this video. Um, let me turn off the audio here because I'm hearing myself on loopback. Um, but it's just allergies. Also, it's 43 degrees here right now, so I'm also pretty cold. So we got all these things working against my nose here. Uh, first off, I want to thank everybody for watching the channel. It has been a tremendous few years. Uh, we grew in the last three years from like, I mean, boy, when I picked this channel back up a few years ago, um, after kind of letting it simmer for a while, <laughs> we had like 60,000 subscribers. Now we're almost up on 200,000 subscribers, which is amazing. So thank you everybody for watching. It is awesome. Hopefully we'll hit 250 subs by the end of this year. Um, now I wanna give a few housekeeping things here. We got Jason behind the camera over there. Uh, and then we have me. We're running a really small crew because we're still under um, some rules here in the state of Washington. So we're keeping things as small as possible. Because of that, there might be cameras moving around. You might see Jason run in front of the camera. He might trip over a cable and we'll all have a good laugh about it. Uh, just, don't call it just, just don't call it OSHA. Uh, <laughs> so um, the plan today, oh wait, let me cover a, a few more things. Um, I know you guys are gonna be commenting. Unfortunately, I can't read comments while I'm talking to you. I will review comments uh, time to time throughout this live stream. I'm gonna plan on this stream being about roughly an hour long, and I have a few things that are planned. First and foremost, audio is important. I understand that. There's gonna be a slight echo in here. They are literally jackhammering across the street because of course they are. Uh, so I'm gonna just pop into chat right now and take a quick look. Everybody, if the audio sounds good, you please tell me in the chat, just say, hey, audio is great, audio sucks. Let me know, because if there's anything we can fix, I wanna fix it now, I don't wanna, have people suffering through bad audio. I mean, other than the echo and the jackhammers that are going on over there. So tell me, how's your, uh, how's your audio sounding, everybody? Um, give me some audio feedback, guys. I know there's a lot of you in there. Audio is perfect, audio's good. Echoey, yeah, sorry, it's a garage. Not much we can do about that. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. That's part of the, uh, the first part of the audience participation of this video. So, uh, what are we gonna do? We are gonna do a couple things. I, of course, drove the new, uh, I didn't drive, let me rephrase that. I sat in the new Subaru Outback Wilderness just a little more than a week ago. Uh, and then also we are turning in this Onyx XT that we have now had for one year. They are picking it up tomorrow. And we started our one year ownership with this vehicle with a live stream. So where, we, where you guys actually helped me configure this car. We picked everything from the color to the features, even the factory skid plate on the bottom. And so we're gonna wrap it up and say goodbye to the Outback that has been so good to us. Uh, we do have some requests in for some new one-year term cars. I'll let you know how those turn out as we find out. Also, uh, as you all know, I bought the 4Runner. Uh, so we will always have the 4Runner. That will be kind of our 
baseline tester for going against other vehicles that pretend to be off-road vehicles because we know that one is awesome. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we are going to remove the skid plate off of this Onyx XT. I have not even looked at it since we got this. And then we're gonna do a test. And that test involves a sledgehammer. I'm curious if this skid plate is worth anything. Um, because you always have to wonder, you know, uh, what is a skid plate worth? Can it actually protect the underside of the car? And you might think this is a little ridiculous, but it's not. Think about, this is a 4,000 pound car, and if it runs, even bumps against a boulder, that's a heck of a lot more than damage than I can do with a sledgehammer. So I think it'll be really interesting to see exactly how good the Subaru skid plate is. And then we actually have another skid plate that was sent over to us by Primitive Enterprises. Um, Blake, are you in the chat there? Throw your, your, your URL up in the chat if you are in the house. Um, they sent us over one of their skid plates and I mean, I've dealt with Primitive for years. They put the skid plate on my uh, Rallycross car, my legacy car, which is over there, which you can't see. Um, 10 years ago, their stuff was really kind of rough. Awesome, like bomb proof but it was a little rough. They sent me this skid plate for this 2020. I almost cried, it was so beautiful. I almost don't wanna hit it with a sledgehammer, but I'm going to because that's a real skid plate and it should be able to take it, right? So um, let me pop into chat just real quickly here and we'll see uh, if there's any comments that you know need attention. And uh, wow, there's a lot of you. We currently have almost 200 viewers live. That is amazing, thank you everybody. Uh, let's see. Love the reviews. Good morning from Nairobi, Kenya. Dude, good morning. Is that morning over there? That can't be morning over there. That's nine hour difference, maybe? Audio is perfect. Oh, okay, so we're before the audio part. Uh, let's see. Listening at work, but I'll look it up later from Port Orchard. Hey, you got a local? Do you know there are better coffee shops than Starbucks? Yes, I know that. I go to some of the just amazing coffee shops. However, as you might have noticed in a lot of our reviews, A, first off, I did not plan on this being in the shot. We just pulled a Game of Thrones there. Um, there's some amazing coffee shops, Cafe Vita, Cafe Lago. One of my favorites is Victor's Coffee down in Redmond. But the fact is, is none of them are near my house. I'm really about being efficient and getting to the office as quickly as possible. Even for good, 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 amazing coffee, I'm not gonna spend an extra 10, 20 minutes to go get my coffee. I do make coffee by myself at home on the weekends and I have a whole process with that. So this is my get through the week coffee. I also have other coffee that I enjoy. Plus we have an amazing single shot espresso machine up in the office. Basically it grinds and makes the coffee for every single shot. Jason, love that coffee thing? Oh yeah. Yeah, so good. So good. Hey, wait, you know, I'll keep the camera where it was. I'm gonna turn this microphone a little bit more towards you so that when we hear you say it's so good, we know. Oh. Okay, so now Jason is on a mic. Oh wait, is that mic even plugged in? I think it is. Okay, I'm back in the shot. So uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take the skid plate off of this and hopefully it comes off easy. I didn't prep this. Oh, what got me started about this skid plate? I actually have a little backstory here. So when we did the tire test, I think it was last November, um, I needed to swap the tires out and I needed to swap the tires out before I brought them down because I needed to make sure that they cleared, you know, you, you, you do that stuff before you actually do the real production. And I came to jack the car up and in the rally world, if you have a back diff skid plate, you just jack the car up, jack the car up on the skid plate. You just use the skid plate and pull the whole car up. No problem. I've never had a problem. I've always done it. It's just been how I get a car up. Subaru, and I have to say, I love the Onyx here, but um, there's a couple things. Subaru, we gotta talk about this rear diff plate. This rear diff plate is not good, sorry. <laughs> uh, so if you're looking at getting an Onyx and you wanna, you see the rear diff plate as an option, I would recommend against it because I jacked the car up on this and immediately the supports buckled and pushed it against the diff, useless. And you might be saying, 
Well, fine, just don't jack the car up. The whole point of these things is to protect the vehicle and its 4,000 pounds of weight against rocks. Sometimes you're gonna high center on a rock and you need to know that it will protect you. That doesn't do anything, I'm sorry. It just, it's just a joke. It's just not good and I'm sorry. Subaru, love your cars, don't love that. Okay, let's go ahead and take the skid plate off. Um, I got some power tools here. Wait, that's off, righty tightsy, lefty loosey. And then we're going to, oh, and I know you guys have tons of questions about the Onyx and about the Wilderness. We're gonna get to that right after we do the skid plate test. I know, if this was an NBC show, we would be talking about the skid plate until the very last three seconds of the video, and then we would be done. Uh, but this is an NBC. Let's get right to the point, okay? And then we'll do the AMA right after that. See if I, hopefully I don't crush my mic pack. I already have the car up on uh, lifts here. That's the right way. I think it's a 13 mil. Oh, that's a lot of dirt. Ah, oh, hey Jason, you got the other camera switched? That is actually smaller. So there's two 13s and two 10s. Hopefully I can find my 10 mil. Sorry, cover your ears. We're going to go again. Ah. 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 That's a lot of dirt under there. Children, always wear safety goggles. Okay. <sighs> Got to get a 10 mil. By the way, if you work on cars, one of the best investments is a good ah, tool. Come on. This one's really, there we go, 10 mil in the house. So you might be saying, wow, he knows where his 10 mil is. Yeah, it's because I lost it and I had to buy a new one for this. I'm not putting my eyes under it this time. Okay. Okay. So I think we're gonna inspect this. Hey, did anybody out there actually buy a Subaru and uh, got the camera switch? Did anybody out there buy a Subaru and a guy got dirt up my nose? Uh, hazards, man. Buy a Subaru and get this optional skid plate. I've got a couple spacers here. First off, this thing's tiny. Look how small that is. So let's inspect after a year. I mean, you guys have seen the show. We've basically filmed everything we've done. There's one dent right there. That's a big one. Can you uh, get that on camera? So we got one dent there. You can even see the rock going into it. So that protected at least the plastic underpiece. You know, actually it's looking pretty good, all things considered. There's some scrapes up here. So it did a little protection, but it looks like I never actually hit anything that would have completely devastated the underside. Um, yeah, that's good. We, we were good boys. <laughs> um, so let's go ahead and see what a real rock would do. Do we, uh, let's see. Yeah, they're small, stop, out, stop asking. Okay, fine. Does it even cover the oil pan? Uh, not much. Uh, okay, let's, uh, my pizza peel is bigger than that, yeah. Let's see, let's turn that off, okay. Let's, uh, let's try a sledgehammer. Are we ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, wh first off, I want to know, do you guys think that this is going to dent or is it going to do fine? Uh, on a scale of one to five. So one to five. Five being that it puts a hole through it and uh, a one being that uh, the, j the uh, sledgehammer breaks. What do you think this is going to do? So five, a hole is going through it. One, sledgehammer breaks. Three, just a nice pleasant dent. What do you guys think? Post it in the comments get the votes in. I guess I could actually like do the voting tool or something. One, five, three. Yeah, sorry, there seems to be a bit of lag on the chat for some reason. Oh, everybody thinks that it's gonna do fine. One person thinks the hammer's gonna break? Okay, okay, I think we get the gist here. Everybody's all over the place on this, so let's give this a try. Ah, we ready for this? That's, a, that's an epic shot you got set up there, Jason, thanks. Okay, three. By the way, OSHA, I, you know, I should see if I have, do I have glasses here? You know, I'm just going to cover my eyes. Okay, three, 
two, one. Actually, that's not bad. Let's try it a little bit harder. Okay. The whole thing's bending, but yeah, that's not too bad. That's actually, that's a little bit of protection. Um, I think my biggest issue with this thing, I mean, that actually did protect against a pretty good ding. Let's, let's try it the other way and we'll bend it back the other way. So we're supposed to put this back on the card before we're done. And. Ah, boy, that's loud. Yeah, it's not too bad. But now the real thing I want to show you here is, and this is not a sponsored video, first off. Um, I'm using Primitive just as an example because I've used their stuff for years and I like it. And the guys over there are fantastic, guys and girls. And, um, but there are other third-party skid plate manufacturers. I've just never worked with them in the past. So uh, not a sponsored post, just this is an example. So this is the primitive skid plate, and this is only one of three, four pieces that give you full underbody protection. Again, not promoting primitive specifically, um, but there's other options if you seriously are going to go off-road, and that doesn't matter if you have a Subaru or anything. The manufacturer skid plates are usually just the bare essentials. These things give you serious protection. And the primitive ones used to be very well, per their name, primitive. But this thing's beautiful. I mean, can we see the whole plate here in this shot? Okay. So, I mean, look at this. They have these perfectly flush oil drain uh, panel that pops out with these little guys in the back here. We have these offsets that are beautifully made. I was just floored with how far they've come with their skid plate designs. Anyway, let's compare the size here. How much protection are we getting? Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's easily 100% more protection, I think. You could like put one skid plate there, one skid plate, eh, close to 100%. Anyway, let's hit this one. Everybody asked before, uh, cover your ears because this is going to be loud. We don't have a sound guy, so it is what it is. Man, this is pretty. I don't know if I want to damage this. <laughs> okay, Blake, you said it will be fine. Let's give it a try. Ah. Did I hit it there? Yeah, I guess I did. There's a, there's a tiny little thing scratch, basically. Let's try that again. Ah. Dang. Okay, get a gun. We need a gun. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, well, okay, the other one turned into almost a pretzel. This one, um, you can see it a little bit more on the back side, but for a sheet of metal, that is pretty darn good. This is some serious stuff here. So if you do have a Subaru or a Toyota or anything, and you're going to go off-roading, definitely look at a plate. There are bigger, better options than what the factory will get you. Even the TRD plate is kind of a bit of a joke. Uh, it looks great, but it's not fantastic, uh, especially compared to the third-party options. So let's, uh, huh, that was interesting. Okay, let's jump into chat and let's uh, take a look at some of the comments here. Uh, what do we got? Um, it's a sheet of aluminum foil, touche. Yeah, so for the price, people are pointing out that it's, it's like 600 bucks. I don't know, I thought it was closer to 400, but still, um, just don't. Just don't. Get, get something serious. They cost close to the same. Uh, if not, every penny is worth it because you're going to protect the underside of your vehicle way better. And that's, that's not just Subaru. I, I, I feel like I really need to stress that. That is not just a Subaru thing. All OEM skid plates are pretty basic. Um, I, there's probably an exception out there. Some Jeep guy is going to go, well, if you get this one, that's perfect. It's just as good as this or better. Yes, I understand that. There might be some exceptions. But in the general rule, go with an after-party one. Um, let's see. I know I said I covered my eyes. I covered my eyes with my hands. I should have had safety goggles, but you know, eight misses the platform and takes my knee out. Come on. Oh wait, no, he's seen the show. Okay. That's fair. <laughs> uh, hard aluminum impressive. Yeah, it's sweet. Okay. Now let's talk about 
How much does that other skid play weigh? So somebody's asking, uh, let's see. So this one's probably, I, I don't have a scale, but this is pretty light. I mean, to be honest, it is pretty light. And yeah, this is going to be heavier. But it's still, it's not too bad. I mean, for its size, it's not as heavy as it looks. Um, but once you start adding on all the parts, I mean, you got this killer front lip. I mean, yeah, this, this, becomes, this becomes a fair amount of weight. You got this mid piece. By the way, this is going on my wife's cross trek. Uh, according to Blake, if I'm not mistaken, I think this is what he said, that this, will, this piece also fits on, this mid armor piece will also fit on my wife's cross trek. So uh, she will be happy to know that I am not going to destroy her car on the next adventure. Uh, and then we have this rear diff piece, with, uh, which is just much stronger. So you put those all together, yeah, you're probably looking at 30, 40, at least 40 pounds probably. Maybe, I'm just guessing. Blake, put it in the comments if you're here. Uh, I'm not sure if you're in the chat. Oh, how hard are they to install? Carlina would break it with her fist. I would not put it past. Does adding a primitive skid plate void the Subaru warranty? I, I can't imagine why it would. It's not a modification to the vehicle. It's an exterior piece akin to a sticker um, in terms of modification. So I can't see that possibly Basically, if they said that it voided your warranty, they would have to prove that it voided your warranty and that they're not going to be able to do that. Um, so is a skid plate available for the Crosstrek Sport? There is a skid plate for the Crosstrek Sport for them. It's not the same exact design. This is a newer design because the 2020 is a newer overall design for the Outback. They have a slightly older design for the Crosstrek because it's a carryover from the first Crosstrek that came out. Um, but uh, you're still looking at the same level of build. It's just not going to be as pretty, I believe, is the answer there. Um, but again, there's lots of people who make these. I like the primitive ones because I've used them on so many of my vehicles, and I have done. I hit a boulder. Okay, so here's a brief story. Here's my primitive skid, skid plate story. It's a short one. Um, back when I was publishing Subi Sport Magazine, those may know, I actually used to publish a Subaru magazine. I also own a Mazda magazine and some others, so it's not just Subaru. But um, the Subaru magazine that we owned, uh, we had built a uh, car called Zero to Hero. It was a 2.5 RS that we did as maximum of a build as possible without adding a turbo onto it. And to furthermore, it was a leased car. So we had to put it back to stock and then give it back to the, the dealer when we were done, which surprisingly went fine. Oh, by the way, somebody out there has a 2.5 RS with a race motor, and they probably bought it for the same price as a regular 2.5 RS. So whoever you are out there, that's a win. In case you're wondering why it idles just a little bit weird, because race motor. Hashtag. Uh, anyway, I was driving back from the SEMA show, and uh, I'm in Washington State, and I was going over Natchez Pass in Yakima, or I was planning on it on the way back from the SEMA show after we were showing our car there. Uh, SEMA show, for those who don't know, is a big car show annual in Las Vegas, uh, aftermarket dealer show. And uh, Natchez Pass had a huge snowstorm. So we're like, whoa, can't go over the snowstorm. I'm on our compounds. Uh, if you ever thought that all seasons were bad on snow, wait till you try our compounds. It's a whole new level of terrifying. Anyway, snow was hitting the pass. I decided to take the canyon road, which was both awesome and also not a great decision. Uh, came around a corner, hit a boulder, probably about this side, size. Uh, entire car high centered on the boulder with the primitive skid plate underneath the vehicle. Literally, the car was like this on the boulder, not a single bit of damage on the car. You hit that, it, basically, it was a big enough boulder, it would have torn out the whole underside of the vehicle had I not had that skid plate, and I wasn't even driving off road. So ever since then, I've been huge fans of their product. Uh, and that was probably a decade ago. Okay, so uh, some people are asking about the Onyx XT. And I have to say, I'm actually really sad to see this vehicle go. Uh, by the way, we're, we're not done with skid plates. If you want to ask questions, you can later. But we're going to move on about and now talk about the Onyx XT. The Onyx XT was actually better than I thought it was going to be. And the reason really is just the level of comfort you get on long trips. There was a trip that I did take, I referenced it in 
the uh, Crosscheck versus Outback video, where uh, I drove from Seattle to Los Angeles to San Diego to Arizona and Las Vegas and then back home. And it was amazing. It was so incredibly comfortable. And that's the thing that you just really can't get from the dealership experience. Also, everybody's body is different. For me, it fit great. The seats are comfortable. I actually wasn't 100% sure if the StarTex material was gonna be great. Turns out I love it. Uh, it's comfortable, it's super easy to clean. You just wipe it off. Uh, and I've had no problems with it. There's been like no wear on the seats, uh, but I've only had it a year. You know, wear usually doesn't happen that quickly. If it does, you have a serious issue with the build of the, of the vehicle. Um, so total miles so far, somebody's asking, uh, can you jump on the camera there? I'm gonna crank this up and we'll take a look. I, I don't remember. Oh, 10,000, it's due for another service. So uh, we have 10,000 miles on this that we did in a year and to be fair, uh, roughly 4,000 of those miles or so was in the last month. Um, but so we put a lot of miles on this thing. I use this basically as my regular go-to car if I didn't have a press car that I was driving or if I needed to put less miles on a press car because some cars we get that are like that. Um, or if I was in between, whatever. Anyway, um, this was great and my kids liked it. I have two kids, my daughter is 13, my son, almost 14. Uh, my son is 11 uh, and they both still fit in the back. It's comfortable, the power is good, it has good passing power. I would totally recommend one of these. I mean, you, you've seen my videos, I like it. Now, the wilderness, however, takes this whole concept and really brings it to the next level the looks are polarizing. I totally get that. Uh, the big cladded things on the side, I'm not sure if that's for everybody. I'm not even sure if that's for me yet. I'm still looking at it going, huh. It does, I think, look better in person than some of the photography, even our own videos. Don't really capture it. And then the car that they had parked was in the shadows, so we had to kind of overexpose the car slightly. So the blues came out a little bit brighter than they really are in real life. So. It's actually a pretty good looking package and you don't have to get it in blue, obviously. Uh, the Wilderness will be available in all the normal colors from Subaru, uh, the blue being just their new signature color for that model that you can only get on that model. Uh, let's pop into the comments and see if there is some questions. Uh, any sign of wear and tear to be worried about with the Onyx XT? Uh, I would say that no, the only thing that was any bit of a interest, that's fine, uh, was, the, um, was the fact that when I brought it in for service, they did find a slight oil leak in the bottom of the oil pan where the oil pan is attached. It's not a stress point. Uh, they just noticed that when they filled it that there was a small issue with the seal. So they were really good. Uh, we went to the Subaru dealer up the street. They noticed it. They had... They said that we need to just reseal it. We need our master tech to do it. So we just need to keep the car for another two hours. Um, they did, and it was back and no problem. It wasn't a stress point. So for those of people going, oh my God, head gaskets. It, it's not even related to that at all. Um, and um, I'm just glad that, you know, they saw it, they fixed it, not a big deal. It's a manufacturer. It was a small, very, very small manufacturing defect. Cars are highly complicated things. I'm happy with it because overall the vehicle's done great. And you've seen what I've done to this vehicle. And I have to say, like, when I went to, like, the dunes with it, I was a little concerned. You know, sand in componentry, that's not always the best thing for a car. Uh, but this thing has shown absolutely, I mean, it drives today just as good as it did when we had it delivered. Um, and I think that's a huge thing. So I have a video coming up where I drove the TRD off-road uh, 4Runner from Seattle to Las Vegas through Death Valley. You wanna talk about something getting shaken. I had, no, people said that Death Valley was a rough road. I had no idea. And it wasn't, I was thinking, oh, we're gonna go going to boulders, we're gonna be articulating, it's gonna be great. Not like, you know, Moab, but um, I was thinking more kind of like, you know, just a rough forest road that I'm kind of used to. No, no, it was, it was, uh, it was washboard the whole time. It was, it was like this for five hours and not a single rattle on that 4Runner afterwards. I think most cars would have completely fallen apart. 
Uh, that doesn't say anything about the, the Onyx, but what I'm trying to say with the Onyx is I have done tons of forest roads with this thing. We have brought it up. I mean, you saw our, our hill climb video where it's basically teetering on two wheels. Yeah, it's, um, we have not been kind to it. <laughs> And I don't have a single rattle inside of this. It has actually been a really good car. I know a lot of people are asking about you know, the CVT. The CVT is garbage, is what everybody says. At least that's what they're saying on my wilderness video. They're like, oh my god, it has a CVT, it's garbage. I wouldn't go that far. CVT is not my favorite transmission. I, I honestly, it's a little surgy. Uh, power isn't as complete in spots where you want it to be complete. Um, but I understand why Subaru does it because they don't have a fleet of hybrids. They can't go out and purchase a ton of Tesla credits like Chevy can. Um, they need to get their overall economy to where it needs to be. And the only way they can do that, it seems, now I'm not on the inside, I don't know, but it seems like the only way they can do that successfully and still provide vehicles with good horsepower that are fun to drive is to do it with a CVT. It's a compromise, totally understand that. It's not your thing. If you want a, you know, eight-speed transmission and you want something that's still pretty good, get a 4Runner or get something else. You know, lots of cars, a lot of really great cars actually right now. It's pretty really amazing. I just got out of the uh, Mercedes GLB, uh, which will have a review coming up. Yes, it has an eight-speed dual-clutch transmission, but it's actually a pretty good car. Um, would I spend 50 grand for it? Eh, probably not, but it's still a good car. Okay, uh, are they removing the Onyx XT because of the Wilderness Edition? Uh, I actually answered that in my video, uh, which has now had almost 400,000 views. Thank you everybody uh, very much. Uh, no, the Onyx XT is continuing on. And I asked Subaru about it specifically and they said it is because some people don't want the flash. You know, uh, the, the, the tuner editions, like they're, they're more extreme versions of the STI, big wings and all that stuff they sell to a certain group. Not everybody wants that. Some people want the performance without all of that bling. Uh, for that, they are still gonna sell the Onyx XT, and they're all coming off the same factory line anyway, so uh, it's probably not that difficult for them to do both. Did I find the Onyx drivetrain became more responsive? Oh, uh, my comments just jumped. Uh, did, uh, oh, did the touchscreen, touchscreen prove responsive or did it lag at times? Oh yeah, let's talk about that touchscreen not a fan of the touchscreen. The touchscreen is, I do like the fact that they can add features over time, and they did. They added the ability to turn off the auto start stop. It was originally three clicks into the menu. Uh, well, a lot of people really hated that, so they modified, so they modified, <laughs> Jason's doing something with the camera, I'm just a little confused. Uh, so they modified the, um, the button so it went to the front page. So you can sit there and go, oh, I want auto start, stop off. Boop, there you go. So that's nice, I like that. The screen is big, I love it when I have maps, but if all I wanna do is change the radio or that um, that part of the vehicle is my audio still going because if you did an audio if you did a battery swap my audio would have cut off completely yeah. so but we're good now right yeah. okay sorry for the audio thing there we uh, Jason didn't realize all the audio was running through the camera he just switched the battery on but we're good now so uh, moving up here um, yeah so when I guess that the wilderness in my video I said the wilderness is probably gonna be around mid 40s what I was thinking in my head was I was thinking the price that this Onyx XT with all of the options that we went for was priced at just over 42,000. I was thinking the wilderness was probably gonna be a couple grand more. Um, probably not correct. I, I would expect the wilderness is probably gonna be high 30s, low 40s. I think that's probably more accurate now that I've had more time to think about it. Uh, when you're doing these things on location, by the way, I had like three hours to shoot that entire video. So <laughs> you don't always have a lot of time to think about what you're saying. Uh, but the, um, if you take, uh, what's the price of the base Onyx? Maybe somebody throw that in the comments. I think it's like around 36 or something. So they'll probably be fairly equivalent plus an extra couple grand for the wilderness, I think. Maybe 
two, three grand for the wilderness, but I don't know. Um, we're supposed to have first drives on it within a month or two. And I imagine about that time is when they'll release pricing. That's kind of what Subaru normally does. And then they go into production about that time as well. Yeah, sorry about sound, guys. I'm really sorry. Uh, just saw your comments. Appreciate you sticking around. Um, let's see. I wish they had cr done the Chrome delete to the Onyx. Yeah, the Chrome does not fit on the Onyx. It really doesn't. That's one thing I don't like about the looks of this car. Um, also, of course, the tires. Tires aren't great. Invest in some tires. Uh, we've been playing with tires with the 4Runner. I actually do have a set. This is a world announcement. Wait, world premiere announcement. Anyway, world first announcement. Fine. The tires on that, uh, I'm actually, the first set of tires I'm trying are the Falcon Wild Peaks. I just threw those onto the 4Runner. I'm doing stock size comparison. So they aren't like 33s. Uh, that would be ridiculous on stock suspension. But I'm, I'm actually finding them pretty good. Uh, we'll, do, we'll be shooting a video about that coming up soon. Am I getting a Wilderness Edition next? I will be getting a Wilderness Edition, uh, edition eventually. Uh, I don't know when. And there is a question of will we be getting it up here or are we going to fly out to go test it somewhere? I don't know yet. Uh, it's still too early to say. Thanks again for everybody for holding out for the audio on that. I really appreciate that. Oh, cool. Adrian from the 2020 plus Outback Facebook group. By the way, if you, um, if you want to join, if you have an Outback, you really should join the Facebook Outback group. Uh, it's specifically called uh, the 20, uh, 2020 plus Outback Facebook group. If you have an Outback, join that group. They're a bunch of great people. They have good things to say about the vehicle and they don't, there's not a lot of fluff. I'll just say that it, it seems to be a well-focused group. Some groups can get a little bit out of, uh, out of alignment there. Um, wilderness additions coming to other trim levels. There was a document leaked a couple, what was it, about a year ago or something where we could see Subaru's upcoming plans. I'm not gonna pretend that it doesn't exist. It exists, people have seen it. It's kind of a known thing. Subaru has already said that the Wilderness line is a line of cars, not just one vehicle. The vehicles that we can confirm based on that leak from several months ago include the Forester and the Crosstrek. Should be no surprise to anybody. That kind of makes sense. They've already said other Wilderness models are coming. Uh, I believe Forester is next, and then I believe after that is Crosstrek, and we should expect them over the next two years, probably. COVID has thrown everything into a loop, as has the chip shortages. Uh, the Outback production lines just had to shut down in Japan because they are short processors. And that is not just Subaru. Other car makers have had that exact same problem. I'm still on this camera, right? Uh, they still ha they've had that exact same problem. So it's not because of a quality control issue with the Outback. It's they stop the lines because they, they've run out of parts because of global shortages, which are from a number of reasons. Uh, Subaru has hinted at a wilderness, but blah, 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 blah. I have Falcon Welcome, uh, very soft and comfy. Yeah, actually, that's one thing I'm kind of surprised with the Falcon Wild Peaks is that they're really good just on the road. I'm about to drive to San Francisco for something unrelated, and um, I'm just going to keep them on. Should be fine. Uh, does the Wilderness Edition have worse fuel economy? Yes, it does. You raise the vehicle up and you are going to have worse fuel economy. Uh, that's one reason why a lot of these new crossovers, crossovers like the Ford Mach-E, why do they even call that a crossover? It has less than five inches of ground clearance. A Camry has more ground clearance. Uh, the, the lower you go, the better fuel economy you get. So every time you raise the vehicle up slightly, even a small amount, you lose your aerodynamic effect and it gets worse gas mileage. Uh, that combined with the chunkier tires, they're not super chunky, but they are a little chunky. You're, you're losing one to two MPGs. Uh, on my review on the channel, we actually do talk about MPGs. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's in the video. I think I made a point of it. Uh, so just watch that video. You'll get the facts on that one. I don't have them off the top of my head. Some of my friends, like Sofian and Alex uh, from those two channels, those guys are encyclopedias. You tell them one or two things, they, will, they, they can run through an entire spec sheet. I'm not that guy. That's why our whole videos are more experiential and not quite so heavy on fact analysis. Uh, let's see. Hey, Romania, how you guys doing? 
Um, is the Outback Onyx XT as good as the Forester 2.5 XT back in 06? I love the Forester XT back in 06. Um, no, no, it's not as good. And I would say it's not as good simply because, well, it depends on how you're driving. Uh, the, the slightly longer wheelbase on the Outback, I think, makes it better for cruising. Uh, but there was something really special about that Forester XT. Uh, even the Subaru Japan guys at the time, because we, we drove that one at a racetrack of all places. Uh, it was this private racetrack in the middle of nowhere. I don't even remember what state it was in. The dude was really into MIG fighters, though. He had a lot of, like, fighters, like, park... I anyway, tangent. <laughs> it was just so random. Uh, the, the engineers who worked on that basically said that the 2.5 XT Forester is the STI Forester for the U.S. In fact, they thought that its performance dynamics were just as good or better than the Japanese STI, which had a smaller engine at the time. So uh, maybe I won't go that far because, you know, they're obviously going to say good things about the vehicle that they're launching at the time. But there was just something special. There's certain cars that, I don't want to sound like a snob or too weird, but there's certain things like, like wines and coffees and sometimes there's just something that is just so special. It's the same as everything else. Like it's a, it's a Pinot or it's, it's an Arabica blend or whatever. Um, but there's just something really special about it. And I think that that Forrester XD really had that kind of something special um, going for it. Uh, most annoying things with the Outback for daily use? That's a good question, uh, Michael. Most annoying things with the Outback are uh, that screen. It's, both, it's a love it, hate it with the screen. When I want Apple uh, Maps full screen, it's glorious. When I actually want to engage with it, it's frustrating. Also, it does kind of not find my phone sometimes. And I have to say that that is really the most frustrating thing. It's really kind of sad that so many car makers have issues with their infotainment. Yet, there are so many really smart people working in tech that you would think that they could fix these problems. And these infotainment systems compared to, you know, compared to an iPhone, they're simple. I would think they're simple compared to the, the intricacies of any modern communication device. Why manufacturers can't give us a better cohesive experience, I just think it's, it's frustrating to watch manufacturers fumble on what should be the easy thing. And I know there's, a, you know what, thousands of moving parts in this thing. But um, it, I just feel, I, I feel like they could get their acts together. Uh, Subaru should get, need some improvements on that system. Uh, but that's not Subaru alone. Every, there's so many people fumbling. I really like the Uconnect though. Uconnect in the Jeep is great. Uh, that's one I have like, I don't think I have any complaints with that one. It's quick, it has everything you need. I don't particularly care for the UI, but that's a personal thing, so. Um, yeah, people are saying, uh, so Matthew, you're saying gas mileage on the Onyx XT isn't great for the city. Yeah, yeah, stop and go, especially if you have a heavy foot. If you totally, anytime you get into boost, you're gonna lose MPGs. Um, I do not, I think, I, you know, I've done several videos about my mileage in this thing. It's like low 20s when I'm on the freeway, but I don't gradually get up to speed. I like, you know, I drive quicker than some. So y there's gonna be some downsides there. Okay, uh, la, 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 la. where are we at? We're at 10.43 already. What time did we start this? We started at uh, about 10. 10, okay. So we're gonna go this for about another 15 minutes. And then we're gonna probably wrap this up. Um, EyeSight has issues. Oh, I have, so with, um, with EyeSight, I have, th there, there's a few things. Uh, so let, I'm not sure where I'm gonna go with this, but I wanna talk about some of the things that not only I've experienced with the Outback, but also that I've read other people have experienced with the Outback. Uh, the Outback group is full of people who are saying that the glass is prone to break, uh, prone to chip, more so than a regular thing. One person said that it's because Subaru's eyesight system requires thinner glass. I don't know, I haven't heard that, but um, it's actually something I'll ask them about because that seems like a significant problem, possibly. I have not had a single chip on it. I've driven through forest roads, freeways, you name it, not had a single problem. Um, but, you know, you get, I, I bought one car in 98, uh, took it out on the, drove it home and got a chip on the glass like immediately. So I think I just lucked out so far, but that is a potential issue uh, for some people that some buyers are really frustrated with is that they get one or two chip pieces of glass. On the other hand, I see a lot of people 
tailgating trucks. And you don't do that because you're going to get a chip piece of glass. So I don't know anything about the people, how they drive, who are complaining that that's an issue. But just be aware that that is an issue that some people have complained about. I haven't had a lot of problems with eyesight. I mean, like I said, I've done 10,000 miles in this thing, and I just drove the entirety of the West Coast the long way. And I used eyesight and lane centering almost the entire way through a variety of different weather conditions. I, I, I didn't have a single problem with it. Um, if you do raise your vehicle, so if you put a lift on it or something, you have to recalibrate it. And I don't know if people who are complaining have had issues with that. If you've had issues with eyesight, maybe post it in the comments. Uh, but I've, I've found it to be very good. And I'm not just saying that you know, for marketing purposes, because I don't care if you buy an Onyx. It doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, but I have not had any problems with it in this vehicle. In fact, we like it so much. That's one reason my wife likes her Crosstrax. She really likes the, um, the eyesight system from a safety perspective. She is new to the idea of letting the car do the radar, not radar, but you know the cruise control, the adaptive cruise control. This one uses visual systems. Uh, she's not quite comfortable with that yet, but she knows it's there, and, but she likes the collision mitigation aspects of it. So there's that. Um, eyesight has issued drivers changes lanes, can confuse distance. Yeah, I, have, I haven't experienced that. Uh, as far as shutting off randomly, the only time I've had eyesight really have issues is in really heavy snow. I was driving back from Nevada and there was a, a whiteout conditions. And yeah, it didn't like that, obviously. Uh, but in day-to-day -day use, never had a problem with it. Uh, what is the, let's see. Let's get some more comments here. Um, somebody says eyesight has been the same. That is not actually true. They did change the cameras and they added um, stronger polarization filters and newer models. Um, I can't tell you exactly where that line was, where they went with the stronger polarization filters, but those help specifically against glare and driving into sunsets um, from making the system shut down. So if you have an older Subaru with eyesight, it may perform not as well in high glare situations as the newer Subarus. Not a change to the actual like software necessarily, but they changed the physical lenses and that improved things. Uh, would I recommend a two-part glass coating? I don't know anything about that, so I can't recommend it or not recommend it. Uh, a few problems with eyesight. Oh, wait, we already got that. Yes, my windshield spontaneously broke while I parked. Had to fight Subaru to replace it. Yep. How do I like my Forerunner? Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's finish up the Subaru here. Um, have you found that if you stay in one lane, eyesight does a good job maintaining vehicle spacing? Yes, I've never had a problem with it. Uh, in fact, that whole uh, road trip video that I posted from, boy, it was a few months ago, uh, that one I used basically eyesight with lane centering the entire way. The only time where, I, where lane centering would shut down is on windy roads. But obviously, it's not built for windy roads. It's built for, you know, high, for super highway lane tracing, not for twistier versions. It doesn't claim to be an autonomous system although some people seem to think it is, but it's not. They don't even sell it as that. Hello from New Mexico. You have a Baja Turbo. Oh, dude, the Baja Turbo. That was an amazingly cool vehicle, which I wish they still made. Some dude, uh, or woman, I don't know. My daughter, my 14-year-old daughter, by the way, says that dude is officially uh, gender neutral. So some dude uh, said that, uh, uh, or Photoshopped, a Baja out of the new Wilderness Edition, and it looks amazing. I was like, oh, that would be amazing. I would love one of those. So hopefully when Hyundai comes out with their new pickup, which is gonna be, it's a unibody pickup, and it's gonna be announced fairly soon here. Ford has their Maverick. Hopefully Subaru will come back to the game with a new Baja or Brat, and that would be awesome. Uh, let's see, I've had great success with centering adaptive cruise. It's awesome. Yep. Do you recommend tinting the front windshield? I don't, I don't know why. I just, again, not something I've ever thought about or done. Uh, will Subaru make an Onyx? You know, will Subaru, uh, Matthew's asking, well, a lot of questions from Matthew, thank you. Um, will they make an Onyx version of, an, an Onyx or Wilderness version of the Ascent? I've heard nothing about that, which is weird because we kind of know what's going on with the other stuff. So I would say if they are going to, probably two, three years out at the soonest. Oh, but dude, just imagine a 
a lifted ascent, that'd be pretty cool. I've actually seen that some guys who have done stuff like that, and it looks seriously badass. Okay. Um, thank you for the passport review. Going to buy one this week. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, something, by the way, about the passport that didn't make it into the review. Uh, the passport also, they're one of the, f t t I was talking to Honda about this, and they've designed the, ca the, the, the main uh, cabin, so it also will prevent intrusion and a collision from stuff in the bed. So if you're in an impact, it has extra reinforcement behind the driver to prevent the load going into the cabin area, which I think is pretty cool. That's, um, that's some serious engineering going on there. If only they would make it ride a little bit higher. <laughs> um, yes, yes, Wilderness Edition fit 33s. Uh, I'm pretty sure you cannot fit 33s on the Wilderness just by looking at it in person. I don't see the room there. Uh, maybe with spacers, I don't know. I guarantee as soon as they're out, people are gonna try it though. Um, oh, what do you mean by goodbye? Okay, so Grumpy Fox is asking, what do we mean by goodbye with the Onyx? Uh, well, this is a one year loaner car from Subaru Corporate. We asked them, we said, hey, we wanna do, you guys say the Onyx is amazing. Well, let's try it in all these different situations and see how well it does. Uh, so we basically said, here's a list of the stuff we wanna do with it. Will you give us one for one year so we can shoot all these videos? And they said, yeah, sure. So we built one, we drove it for a year, we shot all our videos and tomorrow it goes back. So we're saying, Goodbye, Onyx. You've been a good car for us. Hey, Chuck. Czech Republic. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, there is a Portland, Oregon Subaru dealer that specializes in lifting stock Subarus. Uh, I would definitely make sure that they're not just using gap spacers, though, that they're actually using springs, because there's kind of the cheap way and the better way to do it. Oh, and some people were asking, the Wilderness Edition, does it just use a uh, gapper or does it use uh, longer springs? It's actually longer springs. So it has increased travel over the stock um, uh, Outback as well. Would I pick a Passport or a Forerunner? Well, I just bought a Forerunner, so I think that might answer your question. I really like the Passport, but there's multiple reasons why I wanted a Forerunner. First, they're really fun. They're not very fast, uh, but they are really fun. Um, I needed something with integrated tow hooks because we do a lot of vehicle testing with stuff like this and I wanted the ability to do my own recoveries should I need to. The Passport does not have integrated hooks. Also, um, I needed the vehicle that we had to be more capable than 99% of the stuff that we test. So that again, if we get in a sticky situation, we can drive in, recover the vehicle, pull it out without having to call a third party service. Um, therefore, Forerunner, not Passport because the Passport just isn't equipped well enough for those type of uses. Uh, Link, oh, by the way, there's some dude, um, John. John DZ, no, what's his name? His name is slipping me, but if you, if you do a search for passport off-road, you will see there's a dude who actually has a lifted passport and he's taken that thing through trails you would not even imagine. And he's done a ton of videos. Uh, Onyx, final grade. I would give the Onyx a final grade of a, well, there's two different aspects, I guess. The Onyx, when it came out, was supposed to be the off-road adventure version of the Outback. From that capacity, I would give it probably a C or a B, maybe a C plus. And the biggest reason, of course, is the tires aren't great and it didn't have an additional lift. Um, as far as a like normal used car, like on paved roads, I have zero, I, it's an A. I have no complaints about this vehicle. Would buy again, <laughs> although I didn't buy it last time, but you know, I think you get the point. Uh, the Wilderness Roof Rack was changed. Yes, it was. Uh, so the new Wilderness Roof Rack is different. It does, it, first off, it's not as aerodynamic as this one. So that's also part why the MPGs are a little bit lower, uh, but also it, um, it, it will hold up to 700 pounds static, which means you can pitch a tent up on top of it. Uh, but I think it's only, maybe somebody correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, but I think it's only 150 pounds active load. So you can't like throw 700 pounds and then go driving down the freeway at 70 miles per hour. Yeah, the Forerunner is currently built in Japan, uh, but the future Forerunners are not probably gonna be built in Japan. They're probably gonna be on the same line as uh, Sequoia uh, once they integrate all those chassis with the next generation. So who knows what's gonna happen to Forerunner if it's even gonna be nearly as good. 
John DZ adventuring. Thank you. That's somebody posted in the comment. That's the dude who has the lifted passport. Um, check out his videos if you want to see a lifted passport in action. It's it's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, I bought an Onyx XT. Did I mess up if I plan to take it off road? Since I uh, no, the XT can handle mild off road. Uh, both of them can handle mild off road. The biggest issue is the ground clearance, but. Historically, I don't say there's an issue with ground clearance with the Subaru because in its class, it's one of the best uh, in terms of height. It's only an inch lower than the 4Runner, which is pretty good. Uh, just make sure you get some underbody skid plates, which are going to be better third party than if you just bought something uh, from Subaru. So make sure you get yourself a good skid plate and you should be fine. Um, also, some slightly better tires, unless you're going to go rock crawling, in which case you just bought the wrong vehicle. Uh, I don't think that the wilderness is going to be a rock crawler, really comes down to the CVT uh, articulation. It's still an Outback, it's still a unibody. It's not gonna like reach down and grab that traction like a 4Runner or a ZR2 could. A ZR2, that's the, um, the Chevy, ZR2. Uh, which compact SUV do you recommend for a three person family for around $35,000? CRV or Forester? Uh, I like the Forester better than this, the current CRV. The current CRV has a lot of really smart stuff going on for it, but I think just overall, I prefer the Forester. I think it's a slightly better ride, and um, I think it's also uh, the all-wheel drive system is definitely better, as our testing has shown. The CRV all-wheel drive system is not great, uh, but if somebody buys a CRV, I would not knock them for that. It's a reliable, decent crossover. I just think it's kind of on the bland side. Uh, we, we sometimes, for the Northwest Auto Press Group, we do testing where we do get score vehicles on a one to, one to six cat, or was it one to, yeah, it's one to six for some reason. I didn't come up with the scoring that year. And when I tested CRV, basically it's threes across the board. Everything is just fine. And it's good, it's, it's a good crossover, but there's nothing where, there's nothing special I don't think about it. Um, I think the Forester does have something special going on. Definitely not in terms of performance because it is slow, but it is, um, it has a lot of good stuff going on for it other than that. Um, do, 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 do. Lane Keep Assist review, not gonna have time because it goes back tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, we try to do, you know, as much as we can with Lane Keep Assist in all of our regular reviews when a vehicle has it and it's enabled and we do the test right. Uh, sometimes we have actually messed up some tests where we thought a vehicle did or did not have a feature and so we just end up cutting it out of the video because we don't have, you know, it's show don't tell and if we can't show it, we usually won't tell it. Uh, so sometimes we do have to not include features because things didn't go right in filming. Uh, has a lack of a low range ever limited the Outback? If you watch our hill climb video, a low range would have been helpful there. Uh, but that's not really the intent of this vehicle. And a lot of people can say, well, Subaru's really missing the boat by not including a low range. Are they though? I mean, when we started the Subaru magazine back in 2004, Subaru was hoping, really hoping to sell 100,000 vehicles a year. And at the time they had five speed and four speeds and automatics and they couldn't do that. They switched to CVTs, they focused on economy while still maintaining four wheel drive. They, fe they, they improved their interiors and now they're blowing that out of the water. So clearly they kind of know what they're doing. Is it a vehicle for you? Well, I think you have to ask about what kind of off-roading are you seriously gonna do? Is our rock trail the most that you're gonna do? In which case the CVT is fine. I've never had a problem with the CVT. The issue on those hill climbs, yes, more power would be nice, a low range would be nice, but you also have to think about it is incredibly expensive to develop a new powertrain. And we are on the verge of almost every single car maker going to electric only, and those powertrains are not gonna carry over. For somebody to invest $100 million to modify a powertrain for an existing, because it's like, it's like a billion dollars to develop an all new powertrain. For them to modify one's gonna cost millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. So is that investment going to be worthwhile or is it the whole, everybody's not going to buy a legacy wagon unless it comes with a five speed situation all over again. They built that final year production. They sold five, not 500, five. So that's the thing you have to kind of keep in mind. Um, I would like a low range. It's not going to happen. 
I might as well be asking them to add a two inch lift and an extra 100 horsepower because that's not happening either. Okay, uh, let's see. Do you, more aggressive tires on the new, do you think more aggressive tires on the new Outback better than the XT on the new Outback? Oh, the new more aggressive tires that are on the Wilderness, if that's what you're asking. Uh, they're still a pretty mild trail tire. Uh, and a mild trail tire will do a little bit better in mud and in dirt and snow, but they're not going to do as well as even say like the Falcon Wild Peaks, the proper Wild Peak. Um, I forgot the actual designation. Here's the thing to keep in mind too, that for those of you who don't know about tires, I can't just say t Falcon Wild Peak. Falcon Wild Peak is actually like five different tires. There's the trail, which is what comes on the Bronco Sport. Uh, there's the mud terrains, which comes on the Rubicon Jeep. There are the, ah, whatever the designation is on this one, that are four ply that I have on this vehicle. There are eight ply, which are heavier, chunky, oh, well, not chunkier, but they're heavier. They're more reinforced. They're for higher loads. That will actually hurt fuel economy. Again, these are all Falcon Wild Peaks, and most car makers have that kind of designation where you have one brand, but you have like 20 different versions of the tire. So same thing with, um, like somebody was pointing out to me that the Ridgeline tire, they said, no, that Ridgeline tire actually is an all-terrain. And they do make an all-terrain with that same name. I think it's Destination, Dunlop Destination. I think that's what it is. Anyway, they make it with the same name, but that one is not the all-terrain version. It is one with just an all-terrain pattern on the outside. The actual tread blocks are absolutely all, uh, are absolutely all season. And that's what the manufacturer even calls the tire. They call it an all season because they don't have the right compounds or block designs. So you have to be really more specific when talking about tires than just a broad name. A couple more questions and then we're gonna wrap this up because we're at 11 o'clock. Um, why Subaru can't use a ZF automatic or an Ison like the Toyota? It probably comes down to symmetrical all wheel drive and boxer motors. You, you sure you can get anything to work, but can you get it to work efficiently uh, in a manner that is befitting the vehicle with proper driving dynamics? Remember Subaru has a boxer motor. Not everything off the shelf is gonna fit with that. And then you also have symmetrical all wheel drive. So you have symmetrical all wheel drive on this side, you have a boxer motor on this side and you're expecting just some third party transmission to kind of fit in the middle there. I'm sure there's a lot of engineering that goes into it and yeah, they probably could make it work. But again, there's gonna be a huge expense in doing that for a production level thing. Sure, some dude in a shop can do it. I've seen dudes in shops do amazing things that'll blow your mind, but um, that's not what car makers need to do. It needs to be productionable and it needs to be efficient and it needs to work right every single time. Is it a good time to buy a full EV or should I buy, build a gas vehicle next year? That's a nice kind of, uh, that's a kind of nice little wrap up, I guess. Um, should you buy a gas vehicle or an EV? We're now at the tipping point where over the next two years, a majority of vehicles are gonna be available in a plug-in hybrid or an EV version. Um, and then the vehicles that are gonna be like the Forerunner, obviously there won't be an EV version of this Forerunner because this Forerunner is just gonna be sunset. Um, it's gonna be sunsetted when the time comes. And, um, and then they'll have an all new version. But I think any vehicle going forward in the plans, there will always be a plug-in electric version of every brand new vehicle being developed uh, in addition to possibly an EV version. I'm most excited honestly about the pure EVs being developed more, you know, more so than like the plug-in electrics. Um, I love the fact that uh, there was a new trademark for a G-Wagon possibly, uh, an electric G-Wagon. Think about how amazing that would be. Also, how expensive that would be. <laughs> But, oh, dude, a Mercedes G-Wagon all-electric, that would be pretty sweet. Uh, and I think we're going to see, you know, Subaru is teaming up with Toyota because uh, Toyota is a minority shareholder of uh, Subaru. Uh, they bought in after, I think it was Chevy. Was it Chevy? Was it Chevy or G? Uh, anyway, I forget. Um, or was it Chrysler? I think it was Chevy. Owned a minority stake in Subaru at one point. They sold it. And anyway, Toyota ended up with a minority share. Uh, but they've been doing a lot of cross stuff like the new BRZs, uh, the BRZ and the, um, the 86 and, and stuff like that. But we will see fairly soon, I think, a Subaru using a lot of Subaru tech in an electric powertrain. Uh, but it will be, of course, packaged in a way that 
fits the Subaru brand. So that'll be kind of interesting to see. Should you buy one or the other? I think it really depends on your use case. Uh, also, you really have to, you don't wanna, if you're doing international, not international, if you're traveling state to state a lot, I still, you can do it with an electric, and I'm sure the Tesla fans will be like, well, you absolutely, and yeah, technically you can, uh, but I think that there's still a lot of, like, I wanna get in the car, I wanna get to where I'm going, and I don't wanna have to think about where my gas stops are. That's just me, I'm not ready for that. Um, around town, we actually thought about an electric car for my wife, but um, we're right at the verge of a whole bunch of new electric cars. The Mach-E is just the beginning of the major car makers waking up and starting to like actually develop things from scratch for that market to take on Tesla seriously. Everything up until now has been a toe in the water. And I think that once they actually get into serious production on these things, we're gonna see some seriously cool stuff. And with that, I'm gonna have to wrap up this live stream. I wanna thank everybody for joining. This has been fun. Um, I really enjoyed hitting these with the uh, sledgehammer. We are gonna make this stream available for a while uh, to rewatch. So it usually takes an hour or two before it processes and then you can watch it again. Um, I, in about a week or so, we'll roll it into the members only section as usual. Um, and so thank you guys for watching and for subscribing. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Those numbers are important, not just to us, but also to the car makers. When they look at us and they're like, should we send them that car? 200,000 subscribers, maybe we'll send it to this other guy. So it really does help. So please subscribe. Thank you guys for watching. For Driving Sports TV, I'm Ryan Douthit. We'll see you again right here. Oh, and this coming up week, we have the Mercedes GLB. Um, I do all the normal testing, and I think you'll really enjoy it. See you soon. It was on the charger all night and it had a green. Probably a battery, a bad battery. Yeah, I think so. 400, I just got a bunch of people to subscribe and one guy just got a VIP pass. Oh, Mike Wazinski, he's actually, I met him down at, uh, I just met him down in the park when I was filming last time. Um, he was in a 4Runner. He's like, yeah, I saw your review and I bought this 4Runner. I'm like, oh, sweet. Viewers are great. Well, that still says on the air. Are we still streaming? We're probably still streaming. Okay, that's fine. I'll go ahead and cut it off over here. So you guys are still hearing me. I want to thank everybody. Yeah, kiss, kiss, you missed it. Come back next time. Uh, you can hit replay. And Michael, thank you so much for the... Uh, for joining the VIP, that's really helpful. We'll see you guys later.